Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon this Monday uh, in celebration or reflection of Martin Luther King's birthday and the works that he done in the civil rights movement to bring about equality for all mankind. Let us open with prayer. This afternoon, our kind Heavenly Father, Father, we pause just a moment to say, Lord, we thank you. We worship, we adore, and appraise you, and, uh, and praise you for who you are and who we are in relationship to you. Because all who believe in your son, Jesus Christ, have been saved by his shedding of his precious blood. Father, we thank you this afternoon for the struggles we, as a minority group of people, have made and the strides of achieving equality on all fronts. Father, we know that your hand of mercy and grace was upon our late leader, profound leader, the late Reverend Ma Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the followers that he garnered to follow and to address the inequalities that existed in this nation who was supposed to be a Christian nation. Then Father, we thank you for opening the hearts and the minds of all those in leadership who and had the authority to move on our behalf of bringing about equality. We still have a long way to go, but we're not where we used to be. And Father, we thank you for the progress that has been made. And we thank you in advance for the progress that will continue to make, be made if we stay the course and not keep our focus on you and your righteousness as we stand for a right wherever it is, because uh, right is always going to be right, as we fight inequalities on all fronts because they are wrong, because you created us all equal in your sight, eyesight. And you are no respected person. You love us all the same. And you will punish us all the same. Then, Father, I ask you to just speak through me as I prepare to bring this lesson this, this afternoon. We are focused on what do we hope for in the new year? And we looked at some things, and we're going to look at some more things that we can hope in to bring about a betterment in this new year. And Father, I just thank you in advance for listening, hearing, and answering this prayer. And I'm praying it in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen and amen. Well, I don't know all of the words to this song, but I'm going to sing. Uh, let me do a scripture text. And I, I, my mind was led to uh, Psalm first number of Psalm, and it says, it reads as follows, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor seat, sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his laws does he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth his fruit in his season. His leaves shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff that is that which the wind driveth away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish the word of God for the people of God. Okay. Let me sing this song, which I, I, I can do this one. I was going to try and sing, my hope is built on nothing less but Jesus' blood. And but I will do this. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Since I lay my burden down, Glory, glory, hallelujah, 
Since I laid my burdens down, burdens down, Lord, burdens down, Lord. Since I laid my burdens down, burdens down, Lord, burdens down. Since I laid my burdens down. Friends don't treat me like they used to since I laid my burdens down. Friends don't treat me like they used to since I laid my burdens down. Every round goes higher and higher. Since I laid my burdens down, every round goes higher and higher. Since I laid my burdens down, I'm going home to live with Jesus. Since I laid my burdens down, I'm going home to live with Jesus since I lay my burdens down, burdens down, Lord, burdens down, Lord, since I lay my burdens down, burdens down, Lord, burdens down. Since I laid my burden down, glory, glory, hallelujah. Since I laid my burden down, glory, glory, hallelujah. Since I laid my burden down. Amen. Amen. Okay. Once again, we are we're continuing the theme that the mission, National Mission of Women's Auxiliaries chose for the focus of January as a hope for the new year. And show you how the Holy Spirit works. I had in one of my earlier before I got my book, had thought about or had looked at. It was talking about a New Year's resolution, and I included what is, where is Christ in our New Year's resolution? And since this started, I, I taught last week's lesson on talking about we hope to be a blessing, uh, even bigger blessing to others uh, in the New Year. And the other part of that was. Uh, to grow in the grace and the mercy of God, to grow uh, more in the grace and the mercy of God and his love as we, as we reciprocate his love to him because he loved us when we didn't love him. And his the magnitude of his love was displayed through the sacrificial death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So as we continue today's lesson, our focus is, is that uh, staying anchored in Jesus, that's the devotional lesson, and we rejoice and live in peace in God's presence and have peace in the presence of God. So those are some of the things we're gonna really delve into when we ask, what is, what do we hope for in the new year? And one of the things, and, and I'm going to read the chapter of Scripture Texas uh, associated with our devotional lesson, is staying anchored in Jesus Christ. So let us, if you're listening, take your Bibles and go to, go to Hebrews, the sixth chapter, and... We'll talk from, we'll read verses 17 through 19. That's Hebrews, the sixth chapter, verses 
17 through 19. And as soon as I can get there, I'm going to read it to you. And I have some additional uh, suggestions or recommendations about being and staying and staying anchored in Jesus Christ is one of our hopes for us in the new year. And those who are not in Christ will get in Christ. And that is my hope for all of the unbelievers to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And we stay in his word and become anchored in his word. And we who are believers um, remain and stay anchored in him. Okay, and, and let me say this, and we can stay anchored in him as we put God first in our life and commit ourselves to doing his will, and we can turn, increase or make prayer our, our me and my time with God our first our top priority, because when we are in tune with Christ and focus on him, uh, one, the devil can't penetrate that bond because that is a strong bond because when more we pray and talk with God and, and get draw close, get closer to him, I was trying to get out the word to draw closer to him, we are building, a, uh, establishing, if you want to use those phrases, a impenetrable bond between us and God. And when the life, storm life, life storms, they get the beating against our, I'll say our bodies as the shore, we can have the anchor to hold on to, and we will not get washed away. So that before I get, uh, let me, and I have this happen, and I'm doing my best to work on it. But I get so full in the scripture when I'm talking and trying to teach, I forget to read or I omit, uh, just bypass the scripture. So let me pause right here. Hebrews, the sixth chapter, verses 17 through 19. Let me, and it reads as follows. Wherein God, willing, more abundantly to show unto us the heirs of promise, the immutability of his counsel, confirm it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. And that means whatever God promises, it's going to come to pass. Because God can do anything but fail. And he is unchangeable, and he is a man who cannot lie. So we have a strong consolation who have fled for a refuge and to lay hold upon the hope that is set before. God promised to be there with us through every situation. He promised never to believe nor forsake his own. And with what we know about God promises, they certainly is, will be fulfilled. God have not made a promise yet that he broke. And that is, is, is praiseworthy and worthy for us to give God praise and thanksgiving on a daily basis because we have an assured hope in whatever God promises of never ever to forsake us and that all of his promises have been kept. And let me say this. Our anchor is in Jesus Christ cause of what he done for us to redeem all believers from a bondage of sin and redeem us to a life of righteousness where we will have a restored relationship with our heavenly father and that we continue to talk about her hope and I, I'm not trying to get you off but I want to tie it all together I'm going to read verse 19 which Hope we have as an anchor. That hope is, like I said, is Jesus Christ. Anchor of the soul, both sure 
and steadfast, and which entered into that within the veil. Let me just read verse 20 as a conclusion. Whether the forerunner is for us in it, even Jesus made an high priest forever at the order of Melchizedek. Now we know in the Old Testament, the priests would have to go into the Holy of Hosts, of old, Holy of Hosts, to make an atonement for his own sin before he could make an atonement for the sins of the people. Well, Jesus Christ made that one-time sin atonement. And he gave us, through his shed blood, a blood-bought right to approach the throne of God with grace. With grace, let me rephrase all of that. Through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, we have a blood-bought right to approach the throne of God. We no longer need a priest to go in before us and get himself right before he could come and make an atonement for us. Jesus was the perfect sacrificial lamb whose blood washed away our sins because his blood was worthy to pay man's sin debt, whereas man could not pay his own sin debt. So as I can kind of get back to my answering our question, because I've answered part of it, but most of it, of what we hope for in this new year. And as I, um, this is repetitive, so I won't, I don't want you to get off of when I read the scripture, I had to put a pause and then I had to make a conscious effort to always read the scripture first before I get so wound up in the lesson. Is that we, uh, we as believers, is uh, having a hope for, and we will work toward staying anchored in Jesus Christ, because in Jesus Christ is our only hope and only anchor that's going to see us through all of life's storms. Good, good afternoon. How are you? And when we, when our anchor is in Jesus Christ, we have and assurances that we will not be washed away by every false wind of doctrine that's gonna come our way. Let me see if I can look at, let's explain it to you this way. Um, our anchor is a strong metal piece and it made with like two ends on it. That's weight and it's, and it's a cord. Now, and think about a ship, uh, yes, good day. Have, uh, how are you? That when that anchor, when the ship is, is uh, uh, let's talk about a big ocean liners, cruisers, and it is, it has an anchor. And when we get so far, I'm, I'm talking from my experience and cruise experience, that when we get so far before we get to the island, and we will get in close to the island uh, at around midnight. And it wouldn't pull into the island harbor until daylight. So that ship would be sitting out there in the middle of the ocean so far off from the island. But it had it anchored. So it, the wind and the waves and the storm, because I have been in some stormy weather out there on that ship. And you could feel it reeling when it was moving, but when it get that so far and drop anchor, it is steady. What I'm trying to point out is with Jesus Christ as our anchor, regardless of what life storms bring our way, when we are in Christ, we have our anchor. We will be steady it and will not be swayed or tossed to and fro, nor neither swept away because we do not have our anchor in Jesus Christ as he is our anchor. Now let's look at it another way. When you, you see these boats in the harbor, and I'm using boats in a smaller comparison to those big large ships, cause they're like floating cities, a hotel out there on the water. And you see, regardless of how small they are, 
they have an anchor or they tie it down to uh, the post and this, what they call them slips by where they, they pull in. Each boat has, and you see those large marinas, each boat has its own slip that is an area, they call them slips, or the area for them to pull in. This is that my assigned area, that's the next boat is assigned area. So they would be tossed uh, to and fro. And now the water that's waves is constantly moving on that water. Sometimes it is very still, and that's when that water is turbulent or uh, choppy, as they call it, because of the wind and the flowing against the waves that make the waves keep coming and it makes the water choppy. And many smaller boats will not go out in choppy waters. My point here is that even the ships and those boats has an anchor that holds them steady in place when they're not out on the water. And when they get so far and decide to stop there, most of them will try and drop an anchor or oh, the hole is steady in that place. What is my point? Living in a sinful fallen world, we are going to encounter choppy waters. That means the storms of life is going to come against us. And when we, our anchor is in Jesus Christ, we will not be tossed away uh, to and fro or uh, have the, whatever anchor we have other than Jesus Christ to break or come apart and cause us to float away. A float uh, out into the deep waters or uh, the world, I'm using this analogy as the world's, uh, as the world. Because when you're outside of the ark of safety in Jesus Christ, you're in the world, okay? Now, you said, might ask, but well, what are we, am I, I'm still living in this world. Yes, we are in this world, but we are no longer of this world. And we have been set aside or consecrated back to the Lord through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are here in this world. We're left here for a purpose, and I'll get to that in one minute. But we, our anchor is in Jesus Christ. We look to him. We act like him. We manifest his righteousness through our lifestyle every single day. Okay? <laughs> I forgot my question. We are left here in this world to be the light of the world, shining the righteousness of Christ through our daily life. And we are the salt of the world by witnessing the truth of God's world to the, the unbelievers in the world. That's the reason. And doing so, we are making disciples because we are bringing others to Christ. We are teaching and loving them and nurturing them and the truth of God's word. That's why we're left here in this world, because God is still, still building or adding to his kingdom. Christ is all believers who come to Christ is come a part of his universal church. Okay. Now, the question that I had in mind, well, uh, I alluded to this in my opening. How do we stay anchored? How do we stay anchored in Jesus Christ? And let me say it once again. We stay anchored in Jesus Christ by a strong, fervent prayer life. Second Thessalonians 5 and 17 said we are to pray without ceasing, meaning that we are to pray constantly. We should have prayer as part of our daily routine. If it's no, we're not asking God for nothing. If we're not asking God for nothing, we should at least just say, Lord, I thank you for another day. I thank you for what you've done for me. It was because of your convicting work of the Holy Spirit that I heard the voice of Christ and accepted him as my personal savior. So now I have an assured hope of living an eternity with him. And, and then to the thank him for giving his son that who all who will believe in him will be saved. But if, like I say again, if we are no more than thanking God, in our prayer life. And, yeah, and yes, we have uh, petitions that we make to God, 
But I'm uh, let me repeat this again. If we don't have something they're asking God for, just simply pray and say thank you. He's worthy of all of our praises. Let me say this one little thing. I got up this morning and I just simply went to Psalms 150. That is a praise prayer and just praise God. And it's a true saying, and I've lived to experience it, that the more we praise God and thank him, blessings just continues to flow. Okay. Now, we've talked about prayer as part of our being anchored in Christ. Daily scripture reading and meditating on the scripture will help us keep anchored in, in Christ. Because we are, we are focusing and putting God first in our life, our daily life. And I, and I'm not, when I say this, I'm not being cavalier, but I'm just trying to make a point. God is my American Express card. You know that phrase that don't leave home without it? That's how what I mean. I do not leave home without Christ. I always ask for his traveling grace. And, and, and all I'm trying to point out is some recommendations to the answer to the sub question. How do we stay anchored in God? And I'm just giving some recommendations. Because when we stay in the Bible, God, the Bible is a lie. It is God's word. It is true. And when we can stay in his word, we go on. Let me go to Second Peter. Uh, Three and eighteen, I think it is. Peter, 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 and it says three and eighteen, and I'm paraphrasing it here when it said, "Grow in the grace and the knowledge of God." Um, and when we read that scripture and read the scripture, that we will grow in His knowledge, His grace, and His love, because you all get to know Him more. And you get to understand uh, his ways and be willing to commit ourselves to his ways and doing according to God's law. Um, I don't know how many of you was in service or they had to 2 Peter 3.18. I'm reading it to make sure, I, even though I worded it paraphrasing, and it third, grow in his grace. 18, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forevermore. So the more we study God's word, the more we get to know him and to love him and get established in that intimate relationship, we become more focused on him and all of the troubles we're going to encounter. Because I'm saying that we are going to, because we do encounter troubles in our life. We're either going in a storm, and I mean life storms, or difficulties, if you want to call them that, or in one, or coming out of one of life storms. And they come sometime to grow our faith in Christ. And there is a lesson to be learned from some of life's stones. Okay. But it takes me to Romans 8 and 28. It says, all things works together for those for good for those who love the Lord. And what the good thing about in the stones, we'll learn a lesson from that. If it was a mistake that we made, we'll learn that don't do that anymore. And and from that. Our faith should grow or can become strengthened in Christ as he is our deliverer. Yesterday's Sunday school lesson talked about God promised to deliver his people. It was set in the nation of Israel over in their captivity in Babylon, but it's applicable to us today. Because we, if we are not in Christ, we're in bondage to sin. And if we're in Christ, Satan is after us to try to derail 
or destroy our relationship with God. And we and, and we're still talking about staying anchored in Christ. And these are some of the things: prayer, Bible reading, committing ourselves to obey God's word and live according to as he says. Okay. And I was saying uh, the scriptures and Second Peter 3 and 18, while we read. So we can grow in his grace. Now, Romans 12 and 2 tells us, and I will have already told you before I get to it, it says, by a renewing of your mind every day, we have a renewed mind. We do not. Let me go to 12 and 2, Romans 12 and 2. That we can, if we, and I'm talking about reading the scripture and being and complying to what the scripture says, 12, 12 and 2 says this. Listen, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove that what is go good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. And that, uh, what, I, what it's saying to us in keeping with us, staying anchored, in Christ is is by daily Bible reading and meditating. We have a renewed mind because we are growing in God, the knowledge of God, and committing ourselves to do according to God's word. We have that renewed mind. We will not conform to the my favorite word is the foolishness of this world because the world's ways. It's totally opposite of what God, what God's ways are and his, his moral standard. Okay? We don't see God promoting the violence that we see in our society today. He promotes peace. And I'm transferring and, and I'm segueing on into the lesson part of mission, which is peace and God's presence. And as I was saying, when we have that renewed mind, it's a renewed commitment to walk in God's ways, live in peace and harmony with him because God's presence surrounds us daily. We cannot escape the presence of God. He's all around us. And I know, and I'll quote it again from yesterday's lesson. From Paul, not Paul, excuse me. David said in the psalm, I think it's the 51st psalm, that he said, if he took wings on the morning psalm, the presence of God would be there. Even if he made his bed in the pit of hell, God's presence was there. And all I'm repeating to say here is, as we commit ourselves, to doing the will of God and establishing that intimate relationship with God, we can live in peace because his presence surrounds us. And when we focus on him and whatever the storm may be, give it over to God and tell him, Lord, you fight this battle. This is not my fight to fight because God asked us to cast all of our cares on him and he'll take care of it. And all we have to do, give it to him and leave it there. I know that sometimes it's hard to do. That when we, when things, especially when it's for my children, some of my children or love other loved ones, are experiencing some difficulties or adversities. We pray, but we tend to continue the word. And, and, but we have, we have the help of the indwelling Holy Spirit to help us when we give a situation to God, to leave it at his feet and we ask him to fix it. Don't tell him how to fix it. Just ask him to fix it. And because he's already said, I will take care of the problem because there's no problem that we will encounter that he cannot resolve. He has the perfect solution to it. 
And I will say this to you from personal experience. Stop trying to tell God how to fix the problem. Just tell him to fix the problem. Ask him to help me accept his fix, not what I want to have. Accept his fix. Okay? Now, so when we can live, we can, not when, we can live in peace, knowing that God's presence is with us every single day of our life. We cannot escape the presence of God. So another, that will be part of what we hope for this new year, to rest ourselves in peace and the presence of God. When we know that he is, we cannot escape his presence because he's all around us. He knows our thoughts. He knows our heart. Because our heart is the epicenter of our action and thoughts and action. This, well, the main reason that I started, that's why when I'm praying, I'm asking special intercessory prayer. I ask God to touch the hearts and the minds of people because their actions stem from their hearts. Because if he changed, when he changed hearts, they're going to be a changed person. If the evilness that's in the person's heart or the evil thoughts that's in the person's heart, if that changes, there will have there will be no room or desire, better choice of word, for them to act on that negative thought that was in their heart. So, and then peace and hate cannot drive, dwell or live or reside in the same house. The house is us. I can't be at peace with God and thinking evil thoughts plotting to carry out some evil deeds and wishing evil on some of my fellow men, even if the person's sinful life is something I don't like. I do not, I'm not supposed to hate the person, but hate, uh, dislike the, the lifestyle or the hateful act that the person is doing. That's a, it's a fine mind, but we have to do it. And through the indwelling Holy Spirit, we do so. We will be successful in doing so. And another point that I want to make here, and maybe I need to go to John 16, 33, that we can live in peace, even in, all, in the midst of all of the chaos and the calamity that's going on in our world, knowing this, that our Savior Jesus Christ has already overcome the world. That means when he said he died for the sins of the world, but anything that's outside of the perfect will of God, outside the perfect will, of, is a sin. Disobedience is a sin. That's what caused our fall from grace when Adam and Eve, now specifically Eve ate the tree, but God ate the apple, the, the fruit. And but God gave the instruction to the husband Eve, and he went along with the program. Okay, oh, uh, so uh, John 16, I won't read it, but I, that's the one I was talking about. When we know that Jesus have overcome the world, now he is God, don't forget that. He is God and his second person. So if he have already overcome the world, whatever situation we find ourselves in, or the storms of life that we are going through, we can and leave it, taking it and leaving it at his feet, being obedient to his request that cast all your cares upon me, I will take care. And when he said, okay, well, he's already overcome this. All I have to do is give it to him and be at rest my mind and focus on him and thanking him for taking care of our problems knowing that he loves us to that point, that he does not want us bogged down with the troubles of this world. Give them to him and let him take care of them. Let him fight this battle. And I guess I need to go to Second Chronicles, chapter 20, and verse uh, 17, Second Chronicles 20. And I'm, I'm reading this for a purpose, for a reason. And that I would like for us, uh, my, 
my bees and I don't always get together. That for and I'm give you an analogy of this. Okay. All right. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 17. Okay. When I am talking about how we can live in peace, knowing we and that we have the presence of God around us, and knowing and believing in his word when Jesus tells us. I fear not, because I've already overcome the world. And the battles that we are encountering, whether we are personally involved or we are um, concerned, showing through our compassionate love and care for the, what's going on in our world. What verse 17 of Second Chronicles 20 says this, you shall not need to fight this fight, this battle. Set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. Let me say this. Prayer is our most powerful weapon in any battle. Let me just go back to what I said. And my prayer time, and I'm making intercessory prayer. I do not close my prayer without asking God to touch the hearts and the minds of people so there will be a change. And I'm speaking from Second Chronicles 714, when God said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my faith, and turn from their wicked ways. The, his people is his believers who believe in him. And he said, I will do what? I will hear, I will forgive, and I'll heal this land. And I'm going to ask this question because I asked the other day. Do we think, do we not think, when we pray, and we pray whether individually or collectively, or we, in other words, if we all believers is on our court, one accord, asking God to touch the hearts and mind of these wicked people, that would not be a change? I think not, because we know this. God is a prayer hearing and answering God. And when he promised something, he will, he does so. So what I'm trying to say here is I'm trying to impress upon us that yes, we can have that peace with God and follow the, the outlines that I give you. Jesus has already overcome this world. Yes, we may or may not be in a storm, but there is chaos around us that we are concerned about. But, and I, as the scripture just said, this is not our fight to fight. It is given to God and in keeping with what he asked us to do in the scripture, cast all of our cares on him and he'll take care of it. Whether that is personally or the cares and concern of others or our nation. And I'll say this, and I feel this in my spirit. God is getting ready to bring about a change because I do know there's many of, of God are saved of Christian folks is praying about the chaotic, evil situation that's on display in our society, in this nation and the world over. Because in my communication with others from around the globe, they're having some similar issues. And when I pray about our persecuted sisters and brothers over in Africa, in India, in Pakistan, they don't have the religious or uh, the freedom to worship openly like we do. And I'm just saying, I'm praying that we do not take that freedom for granted. That it'll be taken away from. Because I'm going to say this again. Satan is busy trying his best to destroy the believers and God's intimate relationship. And if we uh, 
Let me see how I want to phrase it. Get slack just for one moment. It will signal to Satan. Oh, I can go in that door. But just tell him, no, not today, brother. You know, just because I didn't pray this morning, that don't mean that I am taking God out of first place in my life. It does not mean that. For whatever reason, we always include God in our daily lives. So, and as I get ready to close, I'll take some questions or comments. We have priests with God because we live in his presence. His grace and mercy surround us every day, not just one day, but every day of our life. And that is worthy to say, Lord, I thank you. And what's going to help us keep that strong commitment is our faith in him. An unwavering faith or that steadfast faith that God is who he said he is. He can do what he says he will do. And he loves us too much to want us, I'll repeat this statement, bogged down, stressed out. Because <laughs> we, he, he loves us just that much. He wants us to have a peace of mind. Enjoy his presence and uh, live in communion with him. Let me kind of say this, and I'm almost finished with the lesson, is that when we can reflect back from the stories of what we read about the peace and the harmony that Adam and Eve enjoyed in the Garden of Eden in the presence of God. It was such a harmonious, peaceful time until Satan got jealous of their relationship and he saw he could tempt Eve when God gave them the instruction, gave Adam the instruction. You can eat of everything in this God, but not that tree, the fruit, eat that fruit. And he and filtrated her mind, mixing a little bit of the truth with his, his, his lies and caused that harmonious relationship of peace and harmony to be broken because Adam and Eve represented humanity. Satan is our adversary because he is against God. And I know you may have heard me say this before, but there was a meeting in heaven. Because God, God, Satan got thrown out of heaven because his, as my late pastor Solomon Smith used to say, his high headedness, which meaning he, he wanted to be bigger than God, told God, I will have more followers than you. And God told him, No, you will not. Before I let you win, and I can't find no human being to accept who I am and accept me and my son, I will have the rocks to cry out and become one of my followers, okay? That's not gonna happen. And like I say again, and we read the scriptures, uh, Matthew 6, or not Matthew, excuse me, John 16, 33, when Jesus tells us and reassures us He've already overcome the world. All his attempts and everything that Satan has tried to do, he defeated him on the cross. So we can take that to heart and live. I'm not saying do not be concerned about the chaos in the world. And when we go through our own personal storms, give them to Jesus and let him fix them. Let him fix it. We have peace in the presence of God. Now, next week, I'll close out lesson. Uh, what we talk about is hope for God's favor 
and being eternally grateful. Let us be more grateful and thankful to God for what he's done. Um, I, Sister Servo, if you have a question or comment before I close with prayer, you can do so. Go ahead, Pastor. No questions or comments? <laughs> Not right now, because I'm enjoying myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm enjoying myself, Pastor. <laughs> okay. Well, what I'll do, let me close with prayer. Then I close with our mission book uh, plays. Okay. Father God, we thank you for this lesson. We just thank you for being God all by yourself. And Father, we thank you because you looked and you saw that everything man was going to need to live and have peace in your presence, and you provided it. And Father, we just cannot thank you enough. And for all that you has done, all that you is doing, and all that you will do in our lives, Father, we thank you. And Father, lastly, even in the midst of all of the adversities, and evilness that's going on in our world. Father, all of us who have hid, accepted you and hid ourselves in the secret place of your tabernacle. Father, we are covered by the blood of your son, Jesus, and we thank you, we thank you. And Father, we thank you that you've given us the mind and the heart, the willingness to abide by your truth and it is our shield and buckler. And Father, we pray this prayer in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen and amen. Amen. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I want to close with this uh, pledge, mission pledge. Uh, it says, I pledge by daily reading, meditation, and communion with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to live an upright Christian life, to practice the, his teaching, and my dealing with my fellow man, to dedicate my talent and give of my time, influence, and means to the teaching of spreading the Christian religion at home and abroad, to win souls through personal service for Christ, to encourage and help in the enlistment of young people in the Christian work, and to make my home a center of Christian light and love. To these ends, I pray to devote myself and seek divine aid and guidance daily that I might become a living witness and a bright and shining star for my Lord. Amen, amen, amen. So this concludes our mission lesson for today.